Let's see. Okay. Good. Yeah, good. Okay. So thank you, everyone. And Brandon, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, I'm going to attempt to at least show my face for a second here. Uh, if everybody can see me, I'm Brandon. Um, I can't leave my video on, though, because my uh, camera is getting weird and glitchy, and it will probably cause seizures to those who are affected yes. by flashing lights. So I'm going to stop my video, but this is me. Um, you may have seen me at the nursery if you've been there before. Um, and today we're going to talk about 20 Pennsylvania butterflies and their host plants. And this is in honor of our 20th anniversary year. This is the our 20th season open. Right, Louise? Oh, numbers are so uh, confusing. It's our 21st season, but our 20th anniversary. We founded the nursery in 2003. That makes so, sense. Yeah. yeah, you know, numbers. That, well, that first year doesn't count as a whole. I guess that's season, why. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so 20 years of getting native plants out into the Lehigh Valley. That's what we've been doing and hopefully supporting a lot of butterflies along the way. Um, so I should also say right away as a disclaimer that I am a horticulturalist at Edge of the Woods and I am not an entomologist. So I don't study insects. I just so happen to have to study insects a lot because studying insects teaches us a lot about plants and vice versa, since their, um, their lives are so intertwined. Um, and butterflies are always a really great example of those intricacies in nature where plants and animals, especially insects, intertwine uh, at really intimate levels and that often go right below our noses. So the first thing I wanna talk about uh -oh, is, what is a larval host plant? And when I say larval, I'm referring to the caterpillar or a larvae. So a larva of a butterfly, we all call caterpillars. Um, and they of course come in all different shapes and sizes and looks, and we'll see some different ones in a little bit. But a host plant is the plant species or species that's utilized by that particular butterfly to raise its caterpillars or its larvae on. So while some butterflies may use many different plant species as a potential host, uh, meaning that their caterpillars can eat many different types of plants, uh, quite a few of the butterflies are specialists and they can only feed on one species or maybe one genera of a few different species. A great example um, being our first butterfly coming up, which we'll touch on in a minute. And of course, if we don't have the necessary larval host plants around, if they're not present in an area, we can't have the butterflies because they can't complete their life cycle. You can have as many blooming, flowering, uh, butterfly luring plants as you want, but if you don't have the particular host plants, the certain species just won't last in the area. Eventually they'll be gone. Which brings us to our first Butterfly, probably the most famous butterfly in in the world, maybe, um, especially in the U.S. This is, of course, um, so famous because we all know about this butterfly. It's big, it's orange, it's or black and orange. You can't miss it when they're flying around your garden, um, or if you go on a hike somewhere and you see them out in nature, you just can't miss them. Um, and they are also one of our migratory butterflies, which makes them. Uh, so impressive as a species that this little thing that I don't even think it weighs a whole ounce <laughs> can travel all the way from here or even north of here all the way to Mexico uh, for the winter, which is really great. And then when they get to Mexico, they lay eggs there on the host plants there and new generations return here. So it's really quite a fascinating uh, life cycle and and natural history that they have. And the other good thing is the monarch is kind of an easy butterfly to attract to your gardens by simply planting some milkweed. And milkweeds are, of course, the host plant for the butterfly caterpillars. That's where you'll find them in nature on the milkweed leaves. You can see a, a caterpillar in the middle of the screen there, hanging on a big leaf of a common milkweed that he's munching on. Um, and then, to the right side of the screen, there are some milkweed flowers, the orange butterfly milkweed, and below it, the pink swamp milkweed. 
There are several species of milkweeds native to Pennsylvania. I believe there's about a dozen. Um, and there's a milkweed for almost every garden situation, whether you have sun or shade, or you have wet soil or dry soil, there is a milkweed that will work there. Um, the orange butterfly milkweed that you see there is, of course, uh, the one that everyone wants. Orange is kind of a hard uh, color to find in native plants, and everyone wants to include some in their garden. It's the cheeriest color, right? Um, but the orange butterfly weed is probably one of the fussiest milkweeds. It really requires a lot of very full sun um, and excellent draining soil. Uh, it doesn't need to be in cons constantly dry soil, <clears throat> but its soil cannot retain excess moisture. It must be, well, must be able to drain very, very well. Um, if you have some rock, some rocky soil or some sandy soil, that might work as well. But again, that full sun, if it doesn't get the full uh, sun all day long in the summer, it's not going to thrive. Now, a lot of the other milkweeds, like the common milkweed and the swamp milkweed, um, they're a bit more adaptable. They can get away with a little bit of part shade. Uh, some varying conditions. The swamp milkweed, as its name would suggest, can of course grow in wet soil. Uh, so if you have a wetland, you can grow that one just fine. It thrives even in standing water. Uh, so the totally, totally opposite from the orange one, but totally in equally beneficial to the monarch. And of course, aside from the caterpillars eating the foliage of the, mil of the milkweed plants, um, the adult, the adult caterp the adult butterflies will also feed on the nectar, the flower nectar from the milkweeds. Um, all of them, they like all the flowers of all the species. Very attractive to them and other pollinators. Okay. Now our next one, our next one here, the zebra swallowtail, in my opinion, is probably one of Pennsylvania's most beautiful. Uh, butterflies. It's so striking and it's so appropriately named. It really does have that zebra stripe pattern. Um, even its caterpillars have a lovely stripe pattern there, as you can see in the lower left. Um, one has a slightly darker color, the other one more of a green. But those are both zebra swallowtail caterpillars. Um, and this one is really cool because it hosts on what is probably becoming one of our most popular native plants ever. And that is the papa. Uh, the papa tree, or Asimina triloba, uh, is a small to medium sized tree that grows some very large fruit. Uh, those big fruits there are papa fruits. If you haven't eaten one, they're delicious. They are like the tropical fruit of Pennsylvania. Um, and it is the largest tree fruit that's native here. Um, they're easily grown. You can grow them in sun or shade in moist soil or wet soils, um, well-drained or clay. They're very adaptable. You do need more than one to get fruit, but you only need one to attract the zebra swallowtail. Uh, however, the more the merrier. Um, so those little caterpillars will munch in those giant leaves of that pawpaw tree. Um, some uh, producers of pawpaws in Tennessee or Kentucky now where pawpaws are becoming a bit of a commercial fruit, uh, might actually see the zebra swallowtail as a bit of a pest um, because large numbers of them could certainly damage the trees. But just like all of these plants in nature, um, they sure strike a balance. The caterpillars of our butterflies do not want to kill the plants that they're hosting on because they need those plants. They depend on them for the future. So generally caterpillars will not eat a plant to death. Although if you have too many on one, they certainly might get ahead of it, but not a big tree. A big pawpaw could probably host dozens and dozens and dozens of these caterpillars and would be just fine, unafflicted. Um, another cool thing about this butterfly too, uh, the zebra swallowtail is one of our uh, butterflies that overwinters as an adult butterfly. So that dainty thing uh, hides in the leaf litter all winter long, waiting for spring when it can fly again. Uh, so that's really cool. And now, or very close to now, uh, is going to be a good time to view them as they start emerging on uh, late March, early April. You can see them. Um, they're kind of weak when they come out. Uh, this is what I hear. I have not seen one, <laughs> but this is what I'm told. So I've been trying to look for them uh, in the early spring, but I just haven't seen one yet. 
And part of the reason for that is because one, we, we don't have many wild pawpaws growing in the eastern part of PA. Um, I really haven't seen many wild pawpaws at all here in Pennsylvania. Um, so the host plant probably isn't around. Um, and also there are forest dwelling butterflies. These are usually ones that you'll see in the woodlands, right? Because this host plant grows there in the understory. Um, so unless you're out in the woods, you might not be able to find them. All right, and our third butterfly, the black swallowtail. Uh, this is one that's probably one of our most common swallowtails to see in your gardens. Um, and part of the reason for that is because unlike so many of our native butterflies that require native plants uh, to host on, the black swallowtail has found that a couple of our garden plants make good hosts, such as parsley and carrots. Uh, anything in that carrot family, these caterpillars can eat. Um, in nature, uh, the wild native plant that they would most likely use, and we find them on ours at the nursery, is the plant down in the, in the bottom photo. That's a flower of a plant called golden alexander, or zizia. It's got a fun botanical name, Zizia. Um, that plant's quite beautiful. Uh, it's an early spring bloomer, so it's great for those early season pollinators. And it really just looks like um, parsnips when it's blooming. If you've seen garden parsnips go to bloom, it looks very similar with that umble of flat yellow flowers. Um, and its foliage does kind of remind you of a big parsley or something like that. Um, ideally, the black swallowtail would host on its native plant host like that. Um, but you may very well find these on your uh, parsley and, and related plants. Um, now I want you to look closely there at the black swallowtail's wings. Uh, look at the lower right photo and look at the wing edge and you'll see little roundish or oval shaped white dots on the edge of that wing. And those are gonna be important for identifying this butterfly from other similar looking butterflies. So remember those little round dots there. And also remember right at the center bottom of the butterfly's wings, those two eye spots that are orange with black dots in the middle that look like eyes. Those two features are gonna help us identify this butterfly from similar looking butterflies that you can find in your garden such as the next one, which is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Now we often think of this butterfly like that biggest center photo there, the yellow and blue and black, but sometimes they look like the bottom uh, photo with that black butterfly with some yellow and orange markings. And do you see the big difference there on the side? It doesn't have round dots. It has little dashes or what look like little birds, little wings. Um, so that's one way that you can tell the dark form of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail from the related and somewhat similar looking Black Swallowtail. Um, they don't typically have the dark morph color, but we see them at the nursery. Sometimes they're flying right together, the yellow and the black forms. Um, very cool. I'm not exactly sure why this, this occurs other than the fact that it must just be genetic diversity. Um, but I don't know if there's a pro or a con to being yellow or black, um, but I guess maybe the species is still trying to figure it out, which one's actually best. Uh, that's the caterpillar down there in the bottom. And the caterpillars of the Eastern tiger swallowtail are always a fun one to find because they look like they have an eyeball on their side, that little yellow spot with the blue center, but it's not an eyeball. It's just a marking to trick you. Uh, so if you thought that was an eye, it, it tricked you successfully. It, it made you think that it was looking right at you. But really it's, its eyes are down there on way under that big fold of green down in the front of its face. Um, but that is just a decorative marking, camouflage to make predators think that it sees them. And this plant, or I'm sorry, this butterfly uh, can host on a few different plants, but mostly trees. And the trees that it really seems to prefer are the black cherry, which is to the left, 
Um, you'll see this cherry growing all over. It's, a, it's an early successional species and the birds absolutely love those little berries. Um, or you'll see it on the tulip poplar, um, which is in the top right with that big yellow blossom. That's the big yellow flower of the tulip tree, how it got its name, looks kind of tulip-like. Um, unfortunately, most humans probably don't ever really get to see those flowers because the trees tend to be way too big, um, uh, 70 to 100 feet tall in our woods. Uh, so when they're blooming, the flowers are way overhead. Uh, so you don't often get to see them. Um, but if you wanna see them in bloom, you come to the nursery around late May um, we have some young tulip poplars in the property, but the flowers are right in view. That's how I got that picture. Um, and we often will find uh, those tiger swallowtail caterpillars around the, uh, the base of the tree in the fall as they're leaving to go find a space in the, in the leaf litter to go uh, over winter. So I think that's so cool. And in the fall, they turn kind of an orange color, which is really neat. Uh, the caterpillar goes from that light green to an orangish tone. Um, so really cool butterfly all around um, and quite common despite its large size because thankfully its host plants are quite common. Um, and these are really easy to attract to your garden with things like, well, cone flowers. As you can see, both pictures of the big butterflies are on cone flowers or echinacea. Um, they also love rudbeckia and other um, members of the aster family. Those are great for attracting those swallowtail butterflies. And let's do the fifth one, and then maybe we'll pause to see if there's any questions. And lastly, we have the spice bush swallowtail. Um, now, the spice bush swallowtail looks even more like the black swallowtail than the dark form of the eastern tiger did. Um, you can see that bottom photo there of the butterfly with its wings open. It looks a lot like that black swallowtail did, even down to having the roundish dots on the edge of the wing. But notice what it lacks is that orange eye spot in the middle of the wings at the bottom. So it doesn't have that. So you can identify this one from that one, but that orange eye spot. It also lacks some other markings as well, but that to me is the easiest one to name off right away. Um, the spice bush swallowtail probably has the cutest um, caterpillar out there, again, because of its fake eyes, which aren't really eyes, but they sure look like them. Um, if anyone grew up watching Pokemon, it kind of looks like an anime character um, with those big eye spots and even down to the little glassy white speck there that makes it look like it's actually reflective. Um, very impressive uh, camouflage. And even more impressive camouflage, that center photo is a very young spicebush swallowtail caterpillar, very, very tiny, and it looks like bird poop. And that's how it camouflages itself out in nature uh, to look like bird droppings on a leaf. And it, it's quite perfect. And it really couldn't match it any better. Um, and then that bottom photo where it's green, it's the same exact shade of green as the plant. So they do blend in very well. And to help them blend in even more, you can see in that photo that you can see my finger and my thumb holding the leaf. Um, that's because I'm holding it open because during the daytime, these little swallowtail caterpillars go inside of a leaf and they fold it closed around them to hide. They mostly come out in the evening to feed because uh, it's safer. They won't get spotted by birds or predators as easily. And you can even see in that picture um, around the caterpillar, there's sort of a glossy white uh, film on the leaf, and that is what the caterpillar produces to help keep the leaf closed and keep it stuck shut around it. So it's really quite fascinating uh, how they survive and how they ensure their survival by hiding. And right above that picture is a spice bush loaded with the red berries. The female spice bush gets loaded with fruit. That is the preferred host plant but the spice bush swallowtail will also host on the sassafras tree, which is in the lower left of the frame. You can see those very distinctive leaves with the three lobes, although a sassafras tree technically has three shaped leaves. That's just one of the shapes. Um, but nonetheless, spice bush swallowtail, kind of like the tiger swallowtail, is sort of a common 
uh, butterfly in our area, despite its large size, because the spice bush is literally everywhere. Thankfully, <laughs> spice bush is one plant that deer really don't eat. Um, so our woodlands have a lot of spice bush in them, which is great. If you find any low, damp spot of woods here in eastern Pennsylvania, you will probably find some spice, spice bush growing in them and probably some skunk cabbage too, um, which is great. And again, because the deer don't eat it. And its other host plant, the sassafras, um, is a quite a common tree, especially in early successional spots and places where there's been disturbance and things, uh, you'll find the sassafras quite readily throughout the state. Um, so therefore, its host plants are common, so the butterfly remains common. When the host plants start to disappear, again, that's when we see the butterflies get more and more common. Okay, um, do we have any questions? Yeah, if, um, if you have a question, you can um, type it in the chat and I'll relay it. One person said that they read that the dark morph of the eastern tiger are mostly females. That's interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, and someone else, unfortunately, has a deer eating their spice bush. Well, your deer must not have gotten the memo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's too yes. sad. Well, yeah. like with anything with deer resistant plants, there will always be one that seems to eat it regardless. Um, yeah. But I, I will say with confidence that out of any native shrub. Yeah, they don't eat I, it. I would have to say the spice bush is the most deer tolerant or deer resistant. We have um, a lot of deer in our woods and the only thing that grows is um, spice bush. But someone else is saying um, that the deer are eating the small ones, which I think is true. They, yeah, they that I can see. The little see. ones, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, Nothing is safe when it's tiny and tender. Right. Um, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to say about spice bushes, they do grow an upland too. They don't need to be in the bottom. True. Of land yeah. They're, they're on my my dry hillside. So. Yeah, yeah, they'll grow almost anywhere. They'll even grow in the sun. Yeah, we have a great one in the sun at, at the nursery. Yeah. Yep. Full sun. Feeding hot sun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, can, go ahead and continue with questions on the chat and I will um, relay them or, or whatever. And I guess that's probably a good idea to stop after every, can, can you, Brandon, do you see this arrow? Arrow? I don't know, my, if I put my cursor over the slide, it puts an arrow on the slide. But if you don't see an arrow moving around, then I won't worry about my cursor. I so. don't see anything now. Okay, good, okay. Yep. All right, okay. okay. I'm gonna mute moving myself, along. more of okay. Brandon. Okay, so now we're gonna go to a tiny little butterfly, not like those big ones we started with. This is a little guy called the banded hair streak. Uh, quite a common butterfly. You can see this around your garden pretty regularly. I often spot them on things like Joe pie weed and uh, blue mist flower and things with tiny little fuzzy flowers that they seem to really love. Um, on the top left, I see one there on a milkweed blossom. Um, this guy, this tiny little thing, hosts on some very big plants. Tiny bug, big plants. Um, so big, actually, like white oaks and shagbark hickories and walnut trees, all of which can grow massive, over 100 feet tall. Um, so those little caterpillars, that green little nub <laughs> that you see there in the bottom uh, right corner, that little guy, probably not easy to find because it's going to be in tree leaves quite high up. Um, but if you found a young specimen, you might be able to look around and find them. Um, they're super tiny. Um, and this is just one of many, many, many butterflies that, and, and moths that host on the white oak. The white oak um, is considered the number one host plant. So if you could only choose one tree for your garden and you had the appropriate space to grow one and you really wanted to support uh, butterflies and moths and, and you know, the, the, the larvae, um, plant a white oak because you would, you would be giving the most um, 
the most number of species of potential host in your area. Um, again, a lot of moths and several butterflies and the hickory too, the hickory will host a lot as well. But yes, the banded hair street is just one of many. Um, but I really love this little guy because uh, you know, we often think of butterflies with flashy colors, but the banded hair streak is mostly gray, like a very dull kind of mauve gray color, but it has those beautiful adornments on the edges, little bits of blue, little bits of orange, and I didn't even bother including a picture of it with its wings open because you just about never see it. It's almost always sitting with its wings folded shut. It will very quickly open them and then close them back up again. And the other thing that I really, really love about it and how it got its name is if you look at its antennae and its legs really closely, look at those awesome striping or those bands, the black and white bands on there. So cool. Uh, I just love those on the antenna, especially. It, it, it almost looks not real, like somebody just made that up, but... And, you know, the fascinating thing is that there's a purpose to that. There has to be some sort of reasoning why that butterfly has those bands. And I wasn't able to figure out why through my reading. So it might be one of nature's great mysteries, but I just love it. I think that is the coolest little thing. All right. Now, going to the common buckeye. Now, this is one of those um, butterflies that has a scary looking caterpillar, right? Because as you see there on the, the bottom left side of the screen, uh, the caterpillar is covered in those little prickly spiny things. And we always tend to think that if, if it's prickly, it can sting you. And that's usually a pretty good rule of thumb to bear in, to bear in mind, um, because many of them that have those can in fact sting you a little bit, or at least cause some uh, skin irritation. Um, I do not actually know if the buckeye causes any irritation, but it sure looks like it. But if you look really closely at that caterpillar, it has got some of the most unusual and wacky colors and iridescent blue. It's really, really a lovely, a lovely uh, looking insect, but I certainly don't think I'd readily pick it up. Uh, the butterfly, on the other hand, is much gentler looking, um, <clears throat> has those big, beautiful eye spots on it, several of them. Uh, that's a genius camouflage method that many butterflies utilize, kind of gives the impression of eyes looking back at a predator or makes them look a little bit intimidating to other insects that might think that it itself might be a predator. Um, so ingenious on, on behalf of the buckeye. Um, its host plants are mostly plants that you find in our wetlands here. Uh, the purple flower with the upright spikes to the right is um, blue vervain or verbena hostata. So that's a native verbena. They look quite different than the domestic garden verbenas uh, that you're used to, the annuals. Uh, they look nothing like them. Uh, they're upright and they get these big tall spikes and the bloom lasts a long time, several weeks. Um, and you, you can find that plant pretty readily in wetlands in the area, as well as the plant in the bottom center, which is a monkey flower. Um, there's two species of monkey flower in Pennsylvania, the Allegheny monkey flower and um, the winged monkey flower. They are so darn similar, uh, down to the point of even growing in the same habitat, that no one really even understands why there's two different species, um, but they are different. Uh, nonetheless, though, the common buckeye will use both of them as a host plant. So it doesn't matter which one you have. Um, both of them are useful to the butterfly. Um, that was a common buckeye that I saw at the nursery two years ago. You can see it's a little tattered. Um, but what I really loved about this one is if you look at that one eye spot all the way to the right, uh, it kind of looks like the play button. <laughs> it looks like a little triangle facing or a little arrow facing uh, right in the, in the black dot. And it looks like the little play button that you'd press on a video. But that was really unique, slightly different than the one on the other side. Sometimes butterflies are not perfectly symmetrical, which contradicts uh, what we were taught about them as children. I remember being taught that butterflies were always symmetrical, but that's not true. One side may look significantly different than the other. It really just depends on the individual butterfly. Uh, now, here is one of our most 
beautiful butterflies in my opinion. And unfortunately, I have only gotten the chance to see one of them. Um, but this is the Baltimore checker spot. As you can see, it's like a party of colors. It has got orange and black and white going on in the most fantastic arrangement of patterns. Um, it, it almost has a, a webby look on the edges where the black grips that orange edge. It sort of looks almost spiderweb looking. Um, so cool. The caterpillar also, just like that last guy, uh, a little scary looking with the spikes. <laughs> but I, again, I don't know if it actually uh, would cause any type of irritation. Um, but it's got that beautiful iridescent blue speckling. Um, and generally, when butterflies or, or insects in general boost the show these colors, um, it's to tell other animals, specifically predators, that they are poisonous to eat. So my guess is that the Baltimore checker spot is likely poisonous, especially its caterpillar to, to animals, hence those warning colors, or it's just a fake. It's just trying to psych out predators. Um, Again, I, I tend to study the plants, so I'm not sure on every specific with these butterflies, um, but I'd be willing to bet that there's that those warning colors are playing a role in keeping predators away. And the host plant for this guy, where you can find that cool looking caterpillar, is on one plant only. The Baltimore checker spot is a specialist species, as specialist as it gets because it will only lay its eggs on the white turtle head, which is that interesting looking white flower there on the right side of the screen. <clears throat> the white turtle head is a wetland plant again, just like um, the verbena and the last uh, slide. You'll find turtle head growing in sunny or shaded um, stream sides, pond sides, wet meadows, flood plains, low damp woods, places like that. Um, but it will also grow in more average soils. It doesn't need wet, which is awesome for gardeners um, because you can grow that really unique looking plant in an otherwise average spot or just average moisture um, and still be able to attract and hopefully host this really cool butterfly. Um, I have seen uh, more and more turtle head in the area as the years go on. Now that might just be me paying attention more and, and becoming more uh, observant of it. But around my area specifically up in Carbon County, I've been seeing a lot of turtle head popping up in these wet areas and swales um, along the roadsides in the more rural part of, of the county. Um, so I'm hopeful that within the next few years, maybe some more checker spots will be showing up and I can see some more of these guys because they're just so beautiful. Uh, if anyone gets these in their gardens, let us know in the chat. I'm curious to know who sees these guys because I'm gonna be jealous. Okay, now these two little guys, and when I say little, I mean little. These are, these are the two smallest butterflies on our presentation today. Um, these are very zoomed in photos, um, but really they, they're like the size of your fingernail uh, when you see them out in nature, especially because they're almost always sitting with their wings closed up, so they're really tiny. Um, but that is the spring azure and the summer azure. Um, they're very difficult to tell apart. Uh, almost impossible if you don't have a hand lens to take and look closely at the butterfly, um, which of course you wouldn't even want to handle because it's so fragile um, and so tiny. Um, but that said, they essentially share a lot of the same hosts and they essentially have a, a very similar um, life cycle overall. So I included them on the same slide because let's be real, I'm probably not gonna know which is which if I even see them outside. So I'm gonna include them together. Um, one of their main host plants is our flowering dogwood. Um, that's Cornus Florida. That's that big pink flower over there on the left side. And it's not always pink in nature. It's, it's most often white. The flowers will be white, um, but sometimes they're pink as well. That's a pink one that we have at the nursery. Um, so that's their main host. But they will also host on blueberries, um, viburnums, and possibly cranberry plants as well. 
um, blueberries and cranberries are in the same genus. So it, it certainly would make sense. Um, but you may actually be able to find this caterpillar on your garden blueberry plants if you have blueberries in your garden, which I think is kind of cool. Um, that's the caterpillar on both in the bottom uh, right and left. Um, and in the one photo you see that the caterpillar looks like it's being attacked by ants, but it's actually not being attacked by ants. It's being protected by those ants. Um, these caterpillars have a really cool relationship with um, ants because they secrete some kind of enzyme that the ants eat right off the caterpillar and actually benefit from. And then in return, the ants are always congregating around these caterpillars and therefore protecting them from other insects that might try to attack them. So it's a really fascinating little um, symbiotic relationship there between the ants and this specific caterpillar. And I think that's really unique and really cool. There are other examples of that that happen with some different butterfly and moth larvae, but I believe that this is the only one on our list today. Um, so I think that's just such a fascinating thing. And you can imagine how many millions and millions of years of co-evolving together that it took for the ants and this butterfly to come up with this chemistry that helps them both succeed. And one last note, if you look, I just gotta point it out again. Just like the banded hair streak, because this is a close relative, look at those little banded antennae. I just love it. Little zebra stripe antennae. So cool. Okay. Now, this is a big slide. This is our fritillaries. <clears throat> there are lots of fritillaries um, in Pennsylvania, including these four species that I listed. Um, I believe the one in the picture is the meadow, fr or the, is a meadow fritillary. Although don't quote me, oh shoot. I thought I had a caption, forgive me, that I can't tell you which one that is. Um, but most of the fritillaries look something similar to that, a primarily light orange with a variation of black or brown markings all over it um, in some kind of, usually kind of erratic looking pattern. Um, that's what many of the fritillaries look like. Um, in some form or another. I didn't include them all here simply just to uh, save on a little time. Um, but that is the general look. And one of them there that I found as a caterpillar on our passion flower vines last year, which serves as a host for many of the fritillaries, a really cool caterpillar that's sort of terracotta orange color and those white and black markings uh, down the side that if you look as it goes down grows and it's like four dots combined in the middle and then it goes back to three and then two and then one at the ends. It's really, really neat, really unusual looking. It's got those spines again, which makes you nervous to touch them. But I did touch that one last year and nothing happened. So I don't think they actually hurt you. Just They're just for show. They're just for um, making you believe that they might do something to harm you. So like I said, the passion vine is one host. We have um, one native passion vine to Pennsylvania, and that is that tiny little yellow guy in the corner. It's the yellow passion vine. It's very dainty compared to all the others, but that is the one that's truly Pennsylvania native. And then just a little bit away down in Maryland, you can start finding the purple passion vine uh, like that center photo, but we also sell it because it grows very well here um, and the same insects that live there live here. So it's all part of the same ecosystem um, and it will grow very well here uh, up to up to at least zone six. It's, it, once you get to zone five, you might be a little bit out of range. Um, then you might want to try to look for the yellow one. But if you don't want to grow passion vines, maybe you don't have the space for, for a big vine Violets are the main host plant of fritillaries, um, and there are so many violets. Uh, there's got to be two dozen species native to Pennsylvania, I would guess at least. Um, so many violets. All that violet there in that photo is, is the common blue violet that you see in your yard. And those violets are a butterfly host plant for the fritillaries. So if you see them in your yard and you don't want to keep mowing them over, you could do a couple different things. 
you could mow around them or you can move them. You can dig them up, move them into a flower bed. Uh, the wild violets make really awesome ground covers. They spread quickly. They form very dense mats of foliage. Um, I have them tucked in all sorts of spots in my gardens and I do find fritillary caterpillars on them. Uh, so they do find them. Sometimes I move them from the yard too because I hate to think of them getting mowed over um, with the caterpillars on them. Um, but you can plant all sorts of violets. Some of our native violets are quite small, like the common blue there, usually won't grow more than eight inches tall. Some violets are larger, like the um, viola canadensis, the Canada wild violet, that can grow to over a foot tall. Um, so there's, there's violets for every situation as well. They, there's, there's sun lovers, shade lovers, most of them will grow in either or. Um, and then there's most of them, as far as soil goes, they're very adaptable. So violets are one of the easiest to grow host plants, in my opinion. And they're one of them that you might already have in your garden or your yard you didn't even know. And that was number 10. Okay, so we did have a couple questions and comments. Let me okay. scroll back. Oh, Connie found interesting information about the dark morph of the um, swallowtail. Now, where oh, that good. The eastern tiger swallowtail takes on the dark morph late in the summer, and they are females. Ah. The swallowtails all they, at that time because they mimic the pipevine swallowtail as a defense from predators, and the pipevine swallowtails are toxic, so wow. they mimic the toxic ones. So that's great info. That then, is wonderful yeah, info. Yeah. Then just clarifying, I don't um, remember exactly what we said about the banded hair streak, but it will host on other oak species, not just the white oak. Oh, it's, yes. It's hosts on um, many species of oak, the walnut and the hickory, yeah. and the adult uh, will nectar from a variety of dogbane, milkweed, chinkapin, dogwood, New Jersey tea, meadowsweet, staghorn, sumac, and yarrow. So anyway, I think, let me scroll if we see any other. And then one person did ask, and just as a reminder, we are recording this, and it will be available as a, a link um, as soon as as soon as it apparently takes up some time for Zoom to give us the link. But once Zoom gives us a link, we'll post that link. So, OK. All right. Moving right along. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. That's very interesting about the swallowtail. Thank you for finding that and sharing that with everybody. OK, the silvery checker spot. This is another tiny butterfly, just a little guy, um, but very colorful nonetheless. Very cool little chain-like pattern on its bottom wings there that I think is really cute. And this guy is a bit of a generalist because it will host on many, many members of the Aster family, uh, specifically things like Echinacea and Rebecca, which you see in the lower photo, and Helianthus, um, which is uh, the botanical name for true sunflowers. So it can host on domestic sunflowers. So if you grow annual sunflowers in your garden, the, the silvery checker spot can host on them, but it would prefer wild sunflowers, um, such as that woodland sunflower there in the top photo. Um, our, woodland, our native wild sunflowers tend to be perennial. Um, the domestic sunflower is a native plant. It's just that all the ones that you plant now are cultivars. They don't look like the original wild annual sunflower. Um, but our wild perennial sunflowers are really neat because you don't have to plant them every year. You just plant one and forget it. They're mostly very easy to grow. Um, and they will grow in sun or shaded conditions. There was actually quite a few different species of helianthus that are native, definitely over a dozen. Um, so the, this is an easy butterfly to get into your garden um, because it hosts on a lot of the same plants that it feeds uh, nectar from, which is great. Um, so you kind of get two for the price of one there. And of course, these plants are also a preferred nectar source of many other butterflies. Um, so you can't, you, you can't go wrong, including things like Rudbeckia and Echinacea and Helianthus in a butterfly garden ever, because uh, those are some of the best nectar plants out there for many of our butterflies. Okay, and the 
A related butterfly to the last one, the pearl crescent. Also another very tiny, very cute little butterfly. I'm actually gonna scroll back for one second. I want you to look again. That guy, the bottom corner, the silvery checker spot. Then this guy. So you can see there is some differences, but they share a lot of similar markings as well. So they can be a little bit tough on the first glance to tell apart, but if you can get a picture and take it back, they're easy to tell once you can reference it. Um, there's the caterpillar right below. It's just a little, little kind of a dark gray, uh, nothing too exceptional about that little caterpillar, at least not that I was able to find. Maybe someone else knows some incredible fact, um, but this plant or this um, butterfly will mostly host on asters, um, specifically asters in the genus Symphiotrichum. So to the dismay of plant people everywhere, uh, a few years ago, they completely tore apart the genus that was formerly known as aster, and they reclassified all the plants in it. Um, so these all used, used to just be known as aster something, but now they're mostly known as symphiotrichum. Um, so it's only those asters in that genus that, this, uh, that can serve as a host for the Pearl Crescent. Some of the asters that that would include would be the New England aster, the New York aster, the fragrant aster, uh, the sky blue aster, the frost or heath asters, um, the white wood and the blue wood asters, um, or the white wood aster does not count. That is not a symphiotrichum. Um, the hairy golden aster does not count. That is not a symphiotrichum. So there are a few asters that would not work as a host, but would certainly benefit anyway, because all asters are very valuable sources of nectar for almost any type of butterfly that's still present in the fall. Um, they are a favorite and they're very important um, for all pollinators. Asters and goldenrods in the fall are the staple for nectar sources for pollinating insects before winter. Now, this is a cool one, the question mark. Um, it's got an unusual name, and I love its botanical name, Polygonia interrogationis. So just like, just like its common name, they put it, the, the question mark interrogationis. It, that's so cool. Um, this is a really gorgeous butterfly. And I have to be honest, I have never seen one in person. Um, because again, these butterflies are often found in mature woodlands. So you have to be out in the right spots at the right time to see them. Um, but nonetheless, you can provide the host plants for this butterfly quite easily. Um, its main hosts are two of our native trees. The hackberry, which is the top tree there showing the foliage with some little black berries hanging in there. And then the American elm, um, which is in the lower left side there under the caterpillar. Um, the American elm, of course, uh, has had some trouble the last decade or more uh, because of the Dutch elm disease that has come and sweeping through uh, America. Uh, thankfully, there are Dutch elm resistant varieties of American elm available on the market. They are not hybrids. They are real American elms that have been selected for their natural disease resistance. It's not to say that they are perfectly resistant. They could still get sick, especially if they were not um, uh, planted in the appropriate place or taken care of well, et cetera. Um, they, could, they could certainly still get sick. Um, so if you were nervous about that, but you still wanted to plant one of these trees, go for the hackberry. Um, the hackberry will host this and more. There are other butterflies that use the hackberry as well, um, but there are also others that use the elm. Oh, and this guy has got one of the, the, the most alien looking caterpillars out there, all those multi-headed spines sticking off of it. Really fascinating. Uh, it even has spines on its face, face shield. Uh, that big, that big round part over its head has spines coming off it. So really formidable looking. Um, I wouldn't mess with it. I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> um, but again, I don't know if it is poisonous or not. 
but um, it's certainly beautiful. And related to the question mark um, is the Eastern comma. Um, I, I don't know why these got named after uh, punctuation points, but apparently someone saw these somewhere on the wing patterns. I don't really see a comma, nor did I see a question mark on the last one. So maybe someone in the chat can clarify how they got their names. But just like the last one, the the botan or the um, yeah botanical, the Latin name reflects it perfectly, Polygonia comma. So I think that's really neat. This guy has a few different host plants. I didn't include them all here. Um, I included the American elm again. So just like the last one, because they're close relatives, they share a similar host plant. But the Eastern comma will also host on the wood nettle, which is that plant in the center with the white flowers. The wood nettle is a close relative of stinging nettle, um, but it's native. And just like stinging nettle, yes, it stings. It has little hairs on it that cause irritation. Um, we have not sold that plant before, but I did get seed and we are hoping to have it available this season um, because I've recently learned of its host plant <laughs> um, benefits. So we're hoping to have that guy um, plant it with caution. Maybe not if you have small kids, because again, those spines, um, but we're, we're hoping that that'll be a neat one for the butterfly people out there. And this caterpillar also, you can see, uh, like some of the others, has a bit of a bird poop color to them, uh, playing into that, that um, camouflage pattern, how it has the white back, white and brown. You'll see that in several caterpillars of butterflies and moths. And it's a, it's a really, really ingenious camouflage. Okay. And, okay, wait. Uh, so we have... Um, a wealth of knowledge here from our attend attendees. Um, the question, oh, someone had a question mark, kind of a uh, butterfly in their yard in Berks County. So Great. I'm, I'm so excited. They were excited, but I'm so excited just reading it. So I'm excited um, for them. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. And the naming of the um, comma or the question mark has to do with the marks on the underwing. Ah. When you see a question mark from the side with its wings closed, it resembles a question mark. Ah, that explains okay. it. And Connie says um, it does sting, but I don't know which caterpillar she's talking about because we talked about so many, but um, I don't know. One of them does sting, she said. I think maybe she got stung once. I don't know. So when I see those, little oh, spines. the stinging nettle. The, oh, okay. Stinging nettle. Yes, that stings. Yes. Oh yes, stinging nettle stings and the wood nettle stings as well. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these caterpillars or these spines, I don't actually know if they sting or not, but it's a good rule of thumb that if if it looks like it's gonna sting, maybe don't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. That, right. That's my rule of thumb. I, I have unfortunately encountered way too many saddleback caterpillars. Yeah. And, oh, they're just awful. Well, they're they're, cute. they're cool, but they they are an yeah. awful sting. Yes. All right. Well, we'll 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 hit we'll do 15 through 20 and then we'll break one more time and then we'll do the closing slides. OK, so that brings us to the morning cloak, which is such a gorgeous looking butterfly. Um, it really, to me, looks like something you'd see. In a tropical area, it just reminds me of more of those butterflies you see in like the Amazon rainforest. I love that striking pattern. It's beautiful. And the caterpillar is also really neat with that perfect row of orange dots. Love that. Um, now the drab uh, underside there sure has a bit of a different look than the top, um, but that would help keep the butterfly hidden uh, when it's closed up. You know, you don't want to show off all your best colors if you don't have to, right? So it can help keep it hidden. Um, this has several host plants, but two of its main ones are birches, uh, which there's a, a yellow birch down in the lower uh, left, and poplars um, or aspen trees. Um, two, or the tulip poplar does not count. That is not a true poplar. Um, we're talking more things like quaking aspen and cottonwood. Those are true poplars that are native. Um, very easy to grow trees. Uh, they're, they're early successional, both birches and 
aspens, so they'll grow in poor soils. Um, there's different species of each, uh, especially the birch. You know, we have several birch species, gray birch, yellow birch, river birch, the list goes on. I believe that the morning cloak can host on any birch. Um, it may have a preference of a favorite, but I believe it can successfully host on any birch. And there's pretty much a birch for any situation. Um, the river birches, of course, for the wet. Um, some of the birches, like the yellow birch, can handle significant shade. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of options there. Ah, now the American lady. This is our other migrating butterfly. The monarch gets all the spotlight on the migration, but the American lady makes almost just as an impressive migration. Um, very, very cool. I see these in my garden every year because one of my favorite plants are Antenaria, which are the tiny little plants in the lower left. Those little guys, their common name is pussy toes because those little tiny white flowers sort of look like little cat paws from the bottom, uh, little kitten paws. Um, one of my favorite plants, I tuck them everywhere. They're a great ground cover. They're semi evergreen. Um, there's those charming little flowers in the spring. You can even tuck them in places like between flagstones and um, pavers and things. They're just, they're so awesome. I love them. And they only grow to a couple inches tall. So there's zero maintenance on behalf of the gardener. Um, and such a tiny little plant really does provide such a great host. You can see them very well on the plant. You can find the caterpillars easily on the pussy toes because they fold up the leaf and hide inside. So you can spot those folded up leaves really easily. Um, and it's other host plant um, there on the right side um, is Anaphilus uh, or pearly everlasting. Anaphilus shares a lot of qualities with the pussy toes, sort of that that silverish gray foliage, there's white flowers, um, sort of similar, um, but much taller, a much bigger plant. Um, and it's a colonizer, it will spread, it loves hot sun and poor soil, um, but it will, it will grow in light shade as well, um, and as well as rich soil. It can even be found growing on the beach, um, so it can grow in the sand, which is kind of neat. So if you had especially poor sandy soil, you could get away with growing the Anaphilus. Um, and it's extreme, they're, they're, these butterflies are amazing. You know, many butterflies can smell host plants from miles away. Uh, so they really, they find them just so well. But I have never gone a season with pussy toes or Anaphilus in my garden where I haven't had American lady caterpillars all over them. So it's really great. They're really common, really easy to, to see. And in the fall, you'll see these butterflies in great numbers on plants like ironweed as they're starting to migrate and they need lots of nectar to get them on their journey. Really, really neat. And there, it, it is different than the painted lady. Um, this is a different butterfly. Some people confuse or think that they're two names for the same thing, but they're not. The American lady is different than the painted lady. Uh, now, this is an exciting one for us because last year at the nursery is when I saw one for the first time, and it's that one in the picture. I was able to get some good pictures of it. Um, this is a red spotted purple. Um, this is kind of an uncommon butterfly because it is almost always found in the woods. It really seems to like living in the shaded understory conditions of the woodlands. Um, and its, its caterpillar is not the most charming looking thing there. In the bottom uh, center, it's, it, it's again another bird poop caterpillar. And it's just got the most uh, big sort of ominous looking horns on its head and just drabest colors. But it certainly turns into one of the most beautiful butterflies out there. I love the reverse, that it's dark with orange accents as opposed to orange with dark accents. I think it's so cool. It's like the reverse monarch, right? Um, this guy has a few different host plants, the black cherry, poplars, such as aspens and cottonwoods, and birches. So as you see, as we go through this list, you notice that a lot of these plants are being mentioned more than once, which is great, meaning that a lot of these plants 
serve as a host to more than one butterfly. So you can kind of, you know, if you wanted to pick like certain plants for certain butterflies, you might find that there's a lot of overlap and you might not need as many plants as you thought you needed, which is really cool. All right, and now the close cousin, the closest cousin to the red spotted purple is the Viceroy. This is the monarch lookalike. This is the dupe, the ultimate form of camouflage. We're gonna look like somebody else. Uh, Connie, thank you again for that information who told us about the black or the dark form of the tiger swallowtail is camouflaging itself as another butterfly that's poisonous. That's exactly what the Viceroy is doing. What does it look just like? It looks just like the monarch butterfly, which is poisonous to other animals that would try to eat it. So the Viceroy has completely copied the monarch, taken on its full form, almost, almost identical pattern. There are differences, but it's super, super close um, and evades predators that way, which is so cool. Its caterpillar looks very similar to the caterpillar of its cousin, the red spotted purple but it does not look at all like the monarch caterpillar, right? Nothing like that. So while the adult has mastered the monarch camouflage, the caterpillar is not camouflaged like a monarch at all. Um, and some of its host plants include poplars and willows. Willows, uh, there's some black willow foliage under the adult picture there. Um, black willow is large, medium to large tree that's very common, um, especially in wet areas. You'll find willows popping up everywhere in wet areas, especially along, like if you live here in Lehigh County or Carbon County along the Lehigh River, there's black willow everywhere um, and poplars too, cottonwoods. Um, but the other one that they can use is the pussy willow. Uh, so if you have a pussy willow in your garden, um, the viceroy can also use that as a host. Um, it is another true willow, just like the black willow. So they will use that as well. All right. Ah, yes. Common wood nymph. This guy's cool because it uses warm season grasses as its host plant. Um, for some reason, grasses are not usually associated with butterflies, I guess because they don't have big showy blossoms. Um, but grasses do flower as opposed to popular belief. They are blooming plants. They produce pollen. They flower. They just don't have big petals. They don't have big flashy flowers and they don't have nectar um, and they're pollinated by the wind, not insects. But nonetheless, their foliage, very valuable to the wood nymph because that's what its caterpillar eats. And as you can see, its caterpillar is very well camouflaged for living in grass. It's very green, almost a translucent little guy. I have found these, or at least I believe these, um, I have to imagine that there's probably other larvae that look similar to those that can be found on grasses, but I have found larvae that look just like that, and I have seen common wood nymphs around. I don't consider them to be the most common butterfly, um, part of the reason being because in nature, warm season grasses aren't, you know, there, there aren't many big natural prairies or grasslands in Pennsylvania. You see some stands of grass here and there, but but you don't see big blue stem a lot out in nature um, in big swaths. So we might not have a ton of appropriate habitat, um, but if you went to like the Lehigh Gap Nature Center where there's a massive grassland with all these grasses, you'd probably find a lot of these butterflies among them. All right, and that brings us to our last one, Silver Spotted Skipper. Now, if I was more invested in the insects, I could probably do a skipper presentation alone on the hundreds of skippers, but I chose the biggest one because it's the easiest one to identify and they're very common to see in your garden. The silver spotted skipper is named for that big white spot on its side, um, which makes it very easy to identify. And it's quite big compared to the other skippers. It's not as tiny. It will host on a variety of plants, mostly plants in the Fabaceae or the pea family. Two of those plants being pictured there, the honey locust at the top, which is a tree, and the amorpha or the false indigo bush um, with the purple flowers. So I say false indigo, it is not Baptisia, 
like the perennial false indigo. This false indigo, Amorpha, is a woody plant. It's an upright shrub um, that can grow to about 10 feet tall. It's really neat to use as a small tree in the garden because it doesn't tend to have low branching. Um, so really, really neat shrub to use as a small tree. And there is that caterpillar. The very, very cool banana yellow with that two-tone red and orange head. What a creepy looking thing. Um, and it looks huge there, but it's actually quite small. It's quite a small caterpillar. Um, I have not been able to find one yet, but I see silver spotted skippers all over my Amorpha every year. I just can't find the caterpillar. So they must hide well or something during the day um, because I really would like to find one. Okay, so we'll pause for questions before we go through the last couple closing slides. Okay, so we had uh, a couple people who were excited that they did have American ladies in Good. their gardens this year. And some, mm. some people actually, someone actually bought a plant that had a caterpillar and a chrysalis on it. So oh, excited. Good. Um, and the American lady, uh, we had a question about where exactly do they migrate to? They they actually migrate to here. They are, they reside in the southern U.S., Mexico, Central America, and they migrate to and temporarily colonize the northern U.S., southern Canada, the West Indies, and Europe. So we're so depending on which way you look at it, they migrate to here, <laughs> and then they go right. back home. Yeah. So um, that was it's just it's the southern U.S. Right. They don't go to Mexico. Yeah. No, they reside in the southern U.S., Mexico, Central oh. America. Oh. Oh. Okay. South south to Colombia. Oh, oh, I see. Wow, and they, they, so they have a far range. Yes, and they go come north all the way I up see. into southern Canada right. and sometimes Europe. Sometimes they stray to Newfoundland and Labrador. Wow. I know. For little things they get around. It's so impressive. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all the that's all the questions and I yep, that was it. Okay. Well, so here's a few tips on planting your host plants. This is, a, you know, we often get questions, well, how do you do it? What's the right way to do it? Well, is one enough? Is, do I need 10? Do I need 100? Do I, you know, we get a lot of questions. And there's a few basic rules of thumbs to follow. For one, one single plant, especially a perennial, a small plant, is not going to make as much of an impact as say three to five, right? If you plant your host plants, again, especially perennials, in clumps of three to five or more, you're making them a lot more visible and attractive to butterflies in your area. If there's only one, it might be missed. But if you can plant more, you're putting more of those pheromones in the air that the plant releases, more of those chemical signaling smells, that the butterflies can smell and find your plants. And also just the visual signaling of the blossoms as well for pollinators in your area. It's also important to include both larval host and adult nectar sources. If you only are planting larval hosts, which many of which might be an adult nectar source as well, but if you're only planting one or the other, you might not be filling in the whole picture. You need to support all stages of life of the butterfly, not just one. And you wanna plant for the seasons, right? You wanna plan ahead. You wanna make sure you have some spring blooming plants, some summer blooming plants, and some fall blooming plants so that you're supporting them all, all season long, all year long. Of course, you don't have to worry about winter blooming because that doesn't really happen here um, and the butterflies are gone. Um, but for spring, summer, and fall, you want blooming plants for each season. Um, and the more the merrier, the more of a diverse, a selection you have, the better. So just to interrupt a little yep. bit when we're talking yep. about blooming, um, uh, one person did bring up and ask, and I, I think it's important to emphasize this, no, do not plant the tropical milkweeds. The, the research is showing that it does extend the bloom season here, but you want to extend the bloom season with plants that are native yes it, it appears that by planting the tropical milkweed here it blooms later and the butterflies don't get the message to migrate as quickly so right. um so um even though that particular phenomenon some people argue about in any event um 
it's always wise to plant what's native to your area because that is what the um, insects evolved with and that's what they're used to. So yeah, just wanted yeah, to get that, that in there. That's a good note. Yeah, no matter what, host plants, nectar plants, they should all be plants that are native. And really they should be plants that when you put them all together, form a plant community. Um, you know, try to try to plant plants that would naturally maybe be found growing together so that you're building an appropriate community. Um, and finally, you wanna avoid using garden chemicals. Now, of course, every now and then you have to use some, but try not to use them, especially right around your beneficial plants um, because a lot of these garden chemicals can harm these insects, um, especially things like neonicotinoid pesticides and things. So you wanna be careful what you're using. Try to use organic and natural solutions when you can. And also note that some organic things are also very harmful to insects. Um, remember there are organic pesticides. So be careful what you're buying and be careful what you're using around your plants so you don't harm insects and their larvae. Um, and then here's another couple tips for further supporting butterflies. Butterflies need water. A lot of people don't think about it, but insects need to drink, but they certainly need to drink. Um, and you can easily make yourself a little insect water bowl. All you need is a very shallow tray, like in the picture there, a bottom saucer of a clay pot works wonderfully. Fill it loosely with some pebbles and some rocks, and then just put some shallow water in there. The butterflies and bees and insects can sit on the rocks, stick their little tongues down in there and drink the water, and they don't have to risk falling in and drowning or getting stuck in the water because they have the rocks to stand on. If you want to make a pretty one, you can use crushed glass, you can use marbles, you can use all kinds of fun things. Just try to keep the water line under the top so that insects don't drown. Um, if you have a very sunny garden, as in no shade, try adding something for shade, whether it's a tree or an arbor or a pergola or a little arch with a vine, something, because butterflies need shade on hot days. They get too hot, just like we do. And that goes the same for almost any insect or any animal. Everything needs to, <laughs> everybody needs to get out of the sun for a little bit. So if you don't have any shade and you have a spot to add some shade, add some shade. And finally, avoid handling butterflies. As tempting as it is to catch them and to raise them indoors and all that, they're so fragile. Um, handling butterflies by their wings especially is, is very risky. Their wings are super fragile. They have little scales that come off on your fingers, uh, very easily damaged. So it's best to watch and observe, but not to catch. Um, although, of course, we've all done it, and every little kid wants to catch a butterfly. I'm not saying don't let your kid catch a butterfly, but teach them appropriate handling and that they're very fragile and that maybe watching them is better. And that's it. That's all I have. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We um, will open for the season April 1. Um, if you have never been to the nursery, we encourage you to come out and um, check us out. We have lots of plants for all sorts of situations. If we're able to, if this weather stays very mild and it turns out we can open sooner, we'll certainly be posting that, but it's definitely April 1. So th thank you to Brandon for this wonderful presentation and thank you to all of you for giving us your time. And Louise, I just wanted to add also, if if you have not been to the nursery before and you're planning to visit this year for your first time, join, consider if you can, if your schedule allows, joining us on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. because we have a free nursery tour every Tuesday at 10 a.m. And that is a really great way to get oriented with the nursery for your first visit. Almost every Tuesday. Every Almost. so often we don't do it. So and every now and then. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so check our website and sign up for it and check, the, you know, on which Tuesdays we have it, but it's all, it's most Tuesdays, but every so often there's, there's one in there. So, um, yeah. always good to check. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Mm -hmm.